a warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today uh, for this virtual academic program on the uh, on aligning resources with the national security strategy. So you are welcome, and I know these are similar faces. So welcome back. Although we cannot see you virtual, I mean in person, but I think we are together uh, at least in the spirit of the Africa Center here. So again, my name is Luca Byung Deng Kwol. I am the academic dean at the Africa Center and also the faculty lead with my colleague uh, Joao. Before we, we start, I would like to invite uh, Kate Knopf, the director of the Africa Center, uh, just to say a few welcoming remarks. I know all of you, you do have her bio, but just to emphasize a few points that Kate uh, joined Africa Center since 2014. And, uh, and before joining Africa Center, she served, she held many positions uh, uh, at the, uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USID, uh, including Assistant Administrator for Africa. And, and she holds MA and BA from John Hopkins University. Uh, Kate, you are most welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. Luca, and warm greetings uh, to all of our uh, dear alumni, uh, friends, and colleagues who are joining us today for this program. Uh, we're so glad to find you uh, uh, virtually uh, for this uh, uh, very important uh, topic on managing security resources. As many of you know, uh, the Africa Center serves as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We seek to advance African security by expanding understanding, and providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. So our mission, therefore, revolves around the generation and dissemination of knowledge through our three organizational pillars, uh, academic programs, research, and engagement. We seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, <clears throat> the Africa Center provides opportunities uh, such as we're uh, embarking on today for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And these exchanges then help to build relationships that are maintained through the center's community chapters, uh, our communities of interest, uh, our alumni programs, uh, bilateral inter interaction, and ongoing dialogue uh, between all of us. This dialogue, we hope, is infused with real-world experience and fresh analysis, uh, and it provides an opportunity for continued learning uh, and catalyzes concrete actions towards achieving our vision. And the vision of the Africa Center is uh, to advance African security uh, for all Africans uh, by uh, uh, effective uh, institutions accountable to their citizens. Now, we think this vision encompasses the official goal of the African Union to end organized armed violence on the continent, uh, and it connects it to the United States' fundamental tenets of democratically governed civilian-led security sector institutions capable of delivering safety and security for all citizens. And so accountability to citizens is an important element of our vision as it reinforces the point that in order to be effective, security institutions must ju not just be strong, uh, but they must also be responsive to and protective of the rights of citizens. And by engaging together military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. And so we look forward to staying connected uh, with all of you, uh, not just uh, during these three weeks of this program, uh, but uh, uh, continuing forward uh, through our uh, ongoing virtual engagements. Uh, uh, our, uh, uh, we hope soon uh, to be back in your countries uh, visiting you uh, and uh, continuing to share with each other through LinkedIn uh, and our other platforms uh, for exchange. Uh, so thank you to Dr. Luca and Dr. Joel for uh, uh, putting together this program for us. 
Uh, and thank you in advance uh, to our two panelists today who are going to uh, bring us uh, some fresh insights uh, and analysis to, to kick off our discussions. Warm welcome to everyone. Uh, we look forward to, to seeing you all uh, in discussion groups and as we continue through this program together. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Oh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, um, as Kate, um, welcome you for this, uh, this program. I think I would like also to echo again to congratulate you for your right decision to decide to attend this timely and important uh, workshop on aligning resources uh, with the national security strategies in Africa. Uh, although we cannot see ourselves, but you represent many different countries and institutions across the continent and with different backgrounds and wealth of experience. Uh, so you are indeed the real experts of your context. And please do be confident and candid in sharing your experiences with us and with your colleagues. Um, as you have attended either managing security resources in Africa or national security strategy development in Africa workshops, uh, so you are familiar with Africa Center, but I would like just to, you may agree with me that the COVID-19 has exposed serious cracks in system of government, capability states, and, and public policies. Uh, this, this pandemic has shown that human security is less at risk uh, of the threat from a build up of nuclear arsenal than by a pandemic that can hardly be fooled by conventional weaponry. It has renewed debate not only about the critical role of institutions and strategic leadership, but importantly, it has underscored the need to revisit how security is perceived, planned, managed, and delivered to the citizen. It has equally exposed further the challenges of aligning available national resources with strategic national goals while meeting urgent and anticipated uh, needs. It has also unleashed unprecedented economic uncertainty and that posed enormous challenges to the alignment of resources and the implementation of budgets in Africa and indeed in the world. So the, uh, as you can see, the other aspect of it also is uh, the budget, as you know, because of the COVID, that were appropriated before the pandemic become unable to adjust with far reaching uh, cuts in public expenditure to meet urgent needs and pressing priorities. It has also exposed the reactive response that resulted in the misalignment of available resources, with the state becoming unable to make a strategic threat off with available natural resources. So as I said, is this, this, this crisis or this shock uh, call for the need to revisit the link between national security strategy and the budgeting process in allocating, aligning, and managing security resources in a rational way and within the public financial management principle. As many African countries are in the process of developing their national security strategies, the application of public resource management principle to the security sector and judicious management and alignment of security resources become both urgent and critical in Africa. These physical challenges caused by pandemic may provide opportunities for rethinking the process of designing and implementing budgeting uh, and security strategies and how to make such strategies and budget agile and adaptive amid unprecedented uncertainty and shock. So the main objective of this, as it mentioned, it is a combination of two, two programs, the uh, managing, managing, sec managing security resources in Africa and then and the national security strategy development in Africa. Our objective is really to provide you a trusted platform uh, to, to candidly share your experiences and to learn from each other about the importance of aligning resources with the national security strategy. We hope by the end of this program to provide you with the necessary concepts, uh, principles and tools that are necessary for aligning resources with national security strategies. 
as leaders in security sector, we expect you not only to, not only to be a strategist, political scientist, legal mindful, but importantly, this program will allow you really to be economists. Uh, for the non-economists, uh, we will be using some economic jargon, uh, such as public expenditure review, contestability, allocative efficiency, and off budget, but we'll make sure that our panelists will simplify this term uh, to your interest. The, uh, the workshop is divided into uh, three sessions. Uh, and, uh, and the idea is to introduce you and to understand the challenges of misalignment of security resources, and to introduce some key concepts, as I mentioned, and principal tools uh, for the alignment and adjustment of security resources. Uh, this concept, principle, or tools will be introduced, analyzed through interactive plenary session and, and, and group discussion. Uh, the workshop is organized to three sessions. The first session, that the session of today, is about the status of public, the status of security expenditure, uh, focusing basically on the public expenditure review. And this is where we want to take the stake. What is the what is what is happening? What is the status of the uh, public ex security expenditure in Africa. And the second session will be on the planning security resources. And the focus here will be on the link between national security strategy and the budget. And the last session will be focusing on managing security resources. Specifically, we will be focusing on public, uh, public expenditure management. So we hope that you will be able to grasp the challenges of misalignment of security resources and to acquire the necessary concepts and, and principles and tools. And just want, want to make some reference for key material that I would, you would like, reading material that we'd like you to, to, to rely on for this, for this uh, workshop. The Africa Center National Security Strategy Toolkit is extremely very important. And then the World Bank book on securing development, as well as um, uh, our colleague will talk later on about the uh, uh, military expenditure by Cipri, I will talk, we'll talk more about that one. Let me now introduce to you the, uh, the, uh, the, the session objectives and then the panelists. This session is about the status of security expenditure, public expenditure review. I just want to highlight the best way to test the behavior of any government. It is the way the government is spent the public resources. And the idea is really to gauge what is the behavior of African countries in spending the, uh, the I mean, in, in using their security expansion. And we want to achieve three things from this session. First, we want to assess the trend and pattern of security or military expenditure in Africa. And second, to introduce the concept of public expenditure review and it's linked with the national security strategy development and alignment of security resources in Africa. Third, to discuss some of the lessons learned from the public expenditure review of the security sector in Africa and its implication for alignment of security resources with national security strategy. But let me introduce you now the, uh, the panelists. I'm, I'm really pleased that we have a very seasoned economist, uh, Dr. Gary Melante and Dr. Willine Johnson. Uh, that are very expert on Africa, and I will just briefly introduce, uh, and they will help us to start to spark our our conversation about the status of security expenditure in Africa. And as you have the bios, I will just highlight some few points about their experience and expertise. Uh, let me start first with Dr. Gary. He's a program director and focal point for the Global Registry for Violent Deaths Initiative at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. It's called CIPRI. CIPRI is a leading, uh, a leading uh, institution in terms of the military expenditure globally uh, and also military the transparency in the military expenditure. It's a world, it's one of our partners that we always link with. And I'm really happy that having Gary coming from this a very prestigious institution, CIPRI, We'll be referring to the work uh, from time to time. Uh, beside that, when um, Gary worked uh, for the World Bank and advised many multi multilateral institutions like OECD, 
IMF, International Monetary Fund, and United Nations agencies, as well as civil society organizations and government. Uh, uh, his, his subject expertise, which is a, of a great interest, is in the development practice and policy. And, uh, and, and interestingly, he's working also on global indicators of security and development and, and defend, defense economics as well as actually the impact of peacekeeping, the development of peacekeeping, the impact of peacekeeping. Uh, as, and it's also, uh, but he's also security and development nexus that we may be highlighting as well. A great experience also in physical and monetary policy in Africa, especially in the Horn and the Central Africa. And he holds PhD in economics from the University of California. So Dr. Gary really was so delighted having you and so we are really honored. And I believe the participants will be learning from you a lot. Thank you very much for accepting so very early morning um, uh, to, to join us. The, uh, the second panelist is Willine Johnson. So Willine jo Johnson, some of you might have, uh, you know her. Uh, she's a seasoned public finance expert and serves as a consultant on issues related to finance and development. Her current assignment focuses on peace building and strengthening capacity in the security sector of African uh, countries. She was previously uh, the U.S. Executive Director at the African Development Bank and a member of the U.N. Committee for Development Policy. She, she worked for, for, for some time uh, with the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve uh, System, and she served as an adjunct faculty at the United States the Institute of Peace and Columbia and Cornell University. She serves as a member of the Board of Trustees of Tuskegee University, and she holds a degree in social studies from Harvard University and African history from St. John's University, as well as doctorate in, uh, in development economics from Columbia University. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Willing, to join us uh, uh, today. Uh, let us start now our conversation first with, uh, with Gary. Gary, definitely your experience with the CIPRI I know it's quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite important, but importantly being um, uh, defense economies. Uh, you, 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 you agree with me really the best way to, to assess the behavior of African countries is through the, uh, the way they manage budget and especially the expenditure, expenditure side. Uh, can you share with the participants the trend and pattern of military expenditure in Africa? particularly during the COVID-19. Is the military spending excessive in relative terms? Uh, please, uh, Gary, you have about uh, six to seven minutes, please. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Duca. And it's uh, good to see you all. And, and it's a pleasure to be on the panel with uh, Dr. Willeen as well. Uh, I, I wish you all a good afternoon uh, or good morning, where you're, wherever you are. Um, I, I, think this is a really interesting question and a great place to start. Um, as an economist, we often talk about productive and non-productive activities. And productive activities produce things that we can consume. Non-productive activities are things that we do uh, to be able to protect or to be able to uh, uh, divide up the pie of consumption. And so uh, economists have a, have a blind spot when it comes to security and defense economics, because uh, security and military expenditure is not something that people consume. It's very difficult when you're talking to your family and your friends to explain to them uh, how much security they've consumed today. But as you all know, uh, having security is essential. It's vital to being able to have a productive economy. And so we know that it must be, we, we have to produce some security um, and that nation states invest in militaries for a variety of reasons uh, to be able to deliver that security. And so um, this, this question, is it excessive, is exactly the right way to frame it, I believe, uh, because we can't say whether the extent to which uh, military expenditure is too much military expenditure, unless we know what the security threats are, we know what the threat assessment is, what the strategic approach is, and as I understand it, there will be a number of sessions on that. 
And you gathered here are, are, are the experts on that, uh, on doing this strategic assessment. So uh, we, uh, we, we must uh, expect that the security experts like yourselves can be able to make threat assessments and strategic assessments that are reliable, that are honest, that are uh, forward thinking, that are reasonable. Um, and then that means that there's a principal agent problem. That's what we call it in economics. But it just means simply that we have to trust experts. Uh, you have to trust your minister of finance, who you believe to be an expert on economics. And the minister of finance has to trust the Ministry of Defense and you, the strategic experts, to be able to say what the threats are. So when we talk about excessive, um, it's very much grounded on the idea that the actual threat assessments or the security concerns are reasonable, are, uh, are forward thinking, are honest, et cetera. Um, so we've seen some recent volatility in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in military expenditure. Um, we see, for example, Uganda increased its, uh, its expenditures recently uh, by 53% in 2019 and 46% in 2020. Um, and this is largely responding to the ADF threat. Um, a similar pattern is seen in Kenya with Al-Shabaab. And there are countries like Chad uh, where this is a large impact on the budget. So those are responses to particular threats that we see happening. Now, the question whether it's excessive starts to come into where we have the trade-offs, where we have the um, allocative efficiency that Dr. Luca was talking about. We're taking the military expenditure as a portion of all government expenditure. And that's where um, it's the job of the economist or it's the job of the Ministry of Finance to be able to assess out of these expenditures are these uh, is this too much? Is this too little? So when I am trying to answer this question, I don't just look at military expenditure. Typically, most countries are about 1% to 2% of total GDP is military expenditure. So um, one might look at that and say, well, you know, if, if you're around 1% or 1.5%, that's reasonable. However, there are other limitations uh, within the budget. Some countries uh, have a large percentage of government expenditure uh, of GDP. And that means that their budget is much higher uh, and that they have more resources to be able to use. And they are using it for social services, health, education, et cetera, the things that actually move forward development. Those are the consumable goods that I talked about before in the productive activities. Some countries are incurring a tremendous amount of debt and they have unsustainable levels of debt. And one has to ask if military expenditure is increasing while debt is very high and government expenditures on other things are very low, then perhaps that's excessive as well. So um, I wouldn't answer this question by only looking at the level of military expenditure. One has to say, well, what are the threats? And for that, we rely on you, the experts. I, I wouldn't pretend to be an expert on that. And then we also have to say, what is the total budget that the government has? What is the government expenditure? And what debts uh, does the government have? So that I think there's really three components to the answer to this. Um, if I look at that then, and I take the military expenditure from CIPRI, we have all of the data publicly available on the website. Uh, I'll put it in the chat function, or we can put it in the chat function for you to look at. Um, if I take that data, and then I also look at the trend in that data. Or is it increasing? Is military expenditure increasing as a percentage of GDP? Um, and is government expenditure uh, increasing as well? And is debt low? Now, I'm concerned when I see when military expenditure is high, when military expenditure is increasing, when government expenditure on other services or total government expenditure is low, and uh, is decreasing, and when debt is high. Those are the things that concern me. And if I take those criteria, and I consider you know, warning signs that are being flagged for me, then I think I would be concerned about countries like uh, recently about Algeria, Tunisia, Angola, Chad, uh, the Republic of Congo, 
Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Seychelles, and Uganda. So I've just listed some countries. I can go through the details later and during the discussion of why I think each of those might be of concern. But then there's positive examples. There's countries where we see uh, recent decreases in military expenditure, where their government expenditure is high and increasing on other social services and where they're not concerned about debt. And I think four particularly good examples of that are Benin, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Madagascar. Those are places where we see um, this kind of minimum amount of military expenditure vis-a-vis -vis or compared to the rest of the government expenditure. I'll just say two more things uh, and then I'll wrap up uh, because I know we have other questions to get to. Um, military expenditure is very sticky. Once it's set in the budget, it very rarely decreases unless you, the experts, tell government where it can be cut. And so um, already in COVID, we see very little change in military expenditure, but we see shocks to the economy, which means military expenditure is increasing during COVID as a percentage of GDP. So this shock is being borne by the rest of the economy, but military expenditure is not decreasing. Um, and the last thing I'll point out is that we did some analysis on the types of conflicts that countries have, particularly low-income developing countries, and that 91% of those conflicts were internal. They were internal civil wars um, over the last 50 years. So we really need to be assessing what the risk is uh, and what the threat assessment is uh, that is responsive to those types of threats. Uh, and when we're talking about military expenditure. Those are the types of threats that we need to be responding to um, in designing our military expenditure. And we can go into more detail on that and follow up questions. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Oh, well, Gary, thank you very much. I think you really um, uh, provide a very good uh, um, uh, context. And I think the most important what you say is that the uh, countries do perform differently. But on, on average, I think when we talk about military expenditure, it should be against the threat that facing and how you set your priorities. And it's good, it's good that you are providing an example of countries that are doing well and countries that are not doing well. But as you rightly put it, military expenditure per se is not a problem. It is what you use it for. If you, if you increase your military spending in order to really improve growth and, 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 and create stability, that is a very, a very good uh, spending. But I think, as you rightly said, if, if military spending in Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa is increasing, and then you have this internal conflict is actually increasing at the same time. And then there is a very fundamental question, to what level have you been? So really, thank you very much. And I hope for the participants, if you can just keep, if you have any question, even about your country, your region, I think Gary will be available. And I think that the, the resource that he's talking about, this information are available in the city. So we'll be able to, to, to share and it is available. And I believe my colleague, Joel, will be sharing with you as well. Um, the really just build up on what you said, uh, uh, as you say, the, uh, just in the relative terms, and I like the way you said the military expenditure, but is it possible despite there's a variation um, in military spending in Africa? Uh, what do you think the main drivers of such a military spending in Africa? And is there a justification for such a for such a spending in terms of opportunity cost? I know you indicated it earlier, but it would be good if you zoom in a bit on the drivers of this this spending. Uh, we would appreciate. Uh, welcome, please. Thank you, Dr. Luca. So I won't spend too much time on this question. I know I spoke a little bit long on the first one, um, but let's divide up military expenditure into three types, um, just broadly. Let's talk about labor costs. Those are your human resources and all of your staff and, and uh, your standing uh, army, et cetera. Capital, that includes your equipment, uh, weapon systems and other purchases and logistics. So all of the support that's necessary. So if we divide those, those three things up, and, and here it's very difficult, I have to say, and I'll get back to this in the next section, uh, but it's very difficult to speak about African uh, expenditure in these three areas because the reporting 
is very poor in Africa on military expenditure. Uh, there are very few countries that do full reporting. Uh, there are very few countries that do their actual uh, expenditure reporting. That means their actual expenditures rather than what their planned or their budgeted expenditures are. Yet, um, and I know Dr. Willeen will speak to this a little bit as well. Uh, uh, we have an estimate in uh, this book that we've done on inst defense institution building as well that says that 60 to 80% of the cost of equipment, so those are the, again, the weapon systems and the equipment that is being purchased for the military, is associated with the use, the repair, the support, and modernization. So the price tag on uh, weapon systems or on weapons and other equipment is much higher than whatever the acquisition cost is. And we have to remember that. These are commitments that are being made if you buy these, these systems, these weapons, over extended periods of time, uh, and that these costs will be borne uh, over the, the length of, of use. And that uh, in many cases, it, it's actually higher. It's, it could be as much as double whatever the original cost of expenditure was. And then we have to remember that logistics includes all of these other costs, material management, facilities management, movement, transportation, services management, health services. So those, those are all other activities that have to be borne. Uh, and we have to think about those in terms of uh, non-productive activities uh, within the system as well. And of course, all, all of these things need to be done to maintain and keep a professional fighting force. Um, the last thing I would point out here is uh, that the, the opportunity costs are in terms of, of other development goals. And I think the thing that I find most compelling in the conversations we've had, and I've been, I've been very happy to be involved in other trainings with uh, the Africa Center. Um, and I think one of the most compelling things to remind people of when we're having this conversation is that uh, you all have friends and family uh, that are not in the military. And they are going about their lives uh, doing productive activities. They need health. They need education services. They need other government services. And so every dollar or shilling that can be saved uh, in not spent on military expenditure can be spent for these other services. Uh, and th that's what sustainable development is. So when we talk about the sustainable development goals, it's very important to remember that there are opportunity costs. There are costs associated with not investing in health and education for our friends and family for the future uh, when, we, uh, expend, when we have these expenditures. So uh, I think the real question is, where would that money better be spent uh, when we're asking about what is the right amount of military expenditure? And that's where a conversation needs to be had between the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Finance. I'll stop there, Dr. Luke. Well, well oh, thank you very much, Gary. And uh, I, I, we will follow up later on in this sustainable development goals in terms of opportunity cost. And that is a good way of to what level that the spending and military expenditure, I mean, the military expenditure at what level can contribute to the realization of the uh, sustainable development goal by 2030. But it is not. It is not in a way. I mean, this is a real sense of the opportunity cost. The issue, butter and gun, and uh, I think that is the. Uh, there is a good example of the. Uh, but I would really encourage the participants, because this course, this this workshop is about budgeting and and strategies. Please look at the budget of your country, uh, as a good way for to make sense of what what Gary is talking about, especially the the classification of a budget. And when we talk about the drivers, you could see where your country is actually spending its, its money, I mean the money. And I think this, what, what we are seeing over time, in fact, is that the, the labor or the Senate seems to consume a huge amount of the year. We will come later on about the issues of the year, of the, year, the and less investment even in the, in the, in the, in the capital. You know. So I think at least look at you, the budget of your country as a good reference point. So, so when we talk, 
it will make a lot of sense for you to, to know. Uh, uh, and I think some of these budgets are available. Maybe Gary will talk about the uh, in the year. Uh, there's a commitment by the by the member state of the United Nations that the countries will be submitting their information, the data about the military expenditure to the United Nations. And this is another way of having transparency, um, easing the tension, and a willingness for the international community that we are not going to spend uh, this amount of money. Or we are going to spend it, we are going to be clear about it. So this one is available. This information is available. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Gary. Uh, the last question, what are the lessons learned? Uh, and best practices for effective and efficient use of military spending in Africa. And you can give some example if you wish. Uh, Certainly, thank you, Dr. Luca. So, uh, the the of course, the economist is going to say uh, that the best lesson is uh, uh, transparency and better reporting, better information, right? Uh, and part of the reason for that is because this is the foundation of having. Uh, good conversations, good public policy discussions about expenditure. We can't possibly say where there is waste, uh, where maybe there is fraud, what the prior, whether the priorities are being met, unless we have honest conversations and uh, good quality data to be able to talk about ex military expenditure and talk about expenditure in general. Right, and that's the responsibility of the government to be able to deliver uh, good, effective, efficient uh, uh, government services, including security and defense. So, of course, uh, our priority is is better data. And as Dr. Luca mentioned, um, it is a commitment by all countries to report to the UN military expenditure. Very few countries in Africa do this. Only in 2021, so far, only one African country, Zimbabwe, has submitted a military expenditure report to UNSCAR, uh, to, sorry, to UNMILEX. And UNSCAR works with them to be able to build capacity. So there will be, over the next couple of years, a project. Gary, Gary can you just explain that one? <laughs> that couldn't uh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the UN military expenditure reporting system. And actually, I don't remember what UNSCAR stands for. Uh, maybe Dr. Willin or Dr. Luca, you can help me. But it's uh, another UN agency that's actually uh, the security uh, security sector support mechanism. Um, but good, thank you for calling me on that, Dr. Luca. Uh, so there will be a project uh, over the next couple of years with CIPRI to help to be able to build capacity for reporting on this. Um, and so you may you may encounter uh, people that are that are trying to help to build capacity. And the idea here is that there would be better reporting. Now, there's two types of reporting that uh, that typically happens on military expenditure. The first one is um, the planned budget. So you you all meet regularly, whatever the beginning of your fiscal year is, or or uh, with some kind of frequency. And you say this is what will be spent, and this is how it will be spent. But of course, reality affects us all. We didn't expect a pandemic a couple of years ago. So the then there is actual spending. Now what good practice is, is showing what your plan budget is. And as I said, an, an easy way to divide this up is just by capital, uh, sorry, by capital, labor, and logistics, or some other distribution that you have within your systems. Um, sometimes it's done by different forces, sometimes it's done uh, with different cuts of that, but generally to have whatever your planned is, and then to have whatever your actual expenditures were. And, you know, have a little bit of after action discussion with the Ministry of Finance or with whatever your public financial management systems are, to be able to say, this is why we deviated, this is why we changed. This is how we're going to change uh, our expectations or our plans for next year. This is where this money will be spent in the future. So uh, very few countries have a system that's this, that does this well. Um, I do think there was a good example that came out of Liberia with the security sector public expenditure review, particularly with the transition coming out of UNMIL, the UN mission to Liberia, because it was very clear that 
Bone Mill had been uh, taking on some of the security responsibilities and that there was going to be a, kind of a surge, if you will, on the security and justice uh, and police provision. So uh, Liberia, the, the government of Liberia knew that it needed to um, have these, these costs covered for a particular period. And in the course of that, they made a, a good assessment that could be shared by multiple actors, including donors, to be able to say, this is what our costs will be going forward and be able to have a good assessment of what expenditures would be. Um, and that created capacity within Liberia to be able to do that uh, more regularly. South Africa has a very good budgetary system. Uh, thanks, Joel. Uh, South Africa has a very good uh, budgetary system. Um, and that's one of the ways that we know that uh, some of the early response to COVID uh, has been by using the military uh, in South Africa. And some of those costs of those activities we'll be able to, to point out. But it's one of the very few countries in Africa that, um, that has that capacity. And we encourage you to, to start to have those conversations, uh, to start to build that capacity. Um, and this is a good opportunity to learn those, those skills. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Lippe. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And I think that's a very important to, yeah, to keep in our mind the transparency, uh, the very the, the key word actually for the end the reporting. I think for us in Africa, I think what we should know that although sometimes we tend to believe that the, the military expenditure data, they are very classified, the secrets, this culture of secrecy. In fact, this this information is available to the UN system. It's available there for I am a World Bank and with the United Nations. I think the idea is to what level such information is accessible and transparent to the citizen. And I think that's a very important. So Gary, really thank you very much. So idea that net expenditure is nothing, it's about your priorities, the way you set your priorities, the targets, and it should be justifiable in relation to other sectors as well. I think that's the main message coming out. So let me move now to, to Dr. William. Um, um, based on what, what Gary said about the pattern of military expenditure on, on the continent, um, and aware also of the uh, security and development challenges facing Africa, uh, uh, can you explain in a simple terms uh, this nexus between security, development, and governance uh, in the context of Africa as a good framework, when we talk about military expenditure, when we talk about security, it should be within this framework or this nexus. Thank you very much, Dr. Luca. Uh, well, I want to thank the Africa Center for the invitation, but I'm especially grateful that you've asked uh, the question about the security development govern governance nexus, which um, in, uh, Dr. Melante's paper that he just referred to in the book on, on building defense institutions, he talks about how we're really discussing a complex system. So it's not so much a nexus as a complex system. And I thank you for asking me a question that allows me to become a historian again for a minute. As you noted, I, I did graduate studies in history. And if I put myself in the year 2000, as we start this century, I realized that the conflicts of the 20th century were very different from the kinds of internal conflicts that Dr. Milante described, the kinds of conflicts we're facing now. Now, the World Development Report in 2000 spent a lot of time looking at conflict and development. And it pointed out that in the 20th century, we had devastating wars, uh, the world wars uh, that swept across the entire globe. We had colonial struggles that were often violent. And ideological conflicts. And we also had great powers that were had proxy wars where they would fund the conflicts in other parts of the world. In response to these conflicts, the world system 
the United States and United Nations in particular, um, these systems were developed to bring about peace. And at the same time, a system of institutions, the World Bank, which is actually the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, these institutions were built. Um, and in Africa, we had the African countries themselves forming the African Development Bank to bring the countries closer together in uh, economic security. We economists, and I'm sure Gary was one of them, began to look for the peace dividend. We thought that the conflict, the Berlin Wall is down, and now we can actually focus on development. But what we saw as the interstate conflicts ended, we saw new kinds of conflicts. They were internal. Often they were non-state actors, criminal gangs, terrorists, insurgents, and others that were fighting each other or fighting the government. These were new types of conflict. And for the first time, the international development institutions began to look at questions that related to corruption and conflict and the interaction of those um, processes. Now, the first bank to look at that issue was the African Development Bank. And in the mid 1990s, the great political scientist Claude Ake was, gave a full day workshop at the African Development Bank meetings where he addressed the issue of democracy and development. And he looked at what was called the privatization of the state and how there was internal civil discord developing because of the disappointment that people had of not having the basic government services. The state had been privatized. A few people, whether it was a ruling, uh, ruling party, a group, a few people got all of the benefits of the state's resources. And so for the first time, a development bank, and again, the African Development Bank began to develop programs on governance. Others were afraid to talk about corruption because uh, the World Bank in particular, they thought, well, that would be casting dispersions or saying bad things about people in development countries if you talked about corruption. Although those of us who were living in developing countries at the time were always aware that corruption had partners throughout the world. Um, so looking at this new type of war or conflict, suddenly people like uh, Dr. Melante and I, good economists, became interested in the security sector. And so we began to understand that there was this complex relationship. It wasn't just that because there's a war, you've destroyed the projects as we would sit at the board of the African Development Bank and we would count the projects that were destroyed in the war between Eritrea and, and Ethiopia and others. It wasn't just the loss of life or the destruction of conflict. There seemed to be another relationship between development and conflict, where conflict was emerging when development was failing. And so the banks and the United Nations began to dedicate resources to understanding these issues. Of course, it first means you collect data, but it also means that there were new concepts of security that instead of just looking at regime security, we were looking at human security or citizen security. And in that way, 
we began to understand that conflict might emerge when there's a shortage of water, when there's a drought, when people have to move their animals into new grazing lands. We understood that conflict can emerge when there's a failure of development. And we also began to understand that these conflicts were both complex and unique. And in order to understand them, the people within the country must set about in a task to analyze what were the threats to their own countries. And that has led the African Union, as well as other organizations, to ask each African country to do a national security strategy, to understand the threats to their own contra country, and also the, has led the international institutions to lend support for governance reforms. Uh, although the support may be external, the direction has to be internal. And so we have these public expenditure reviews developed by the World Bank and the United Nations that provide a method of guiding and sustaining the reforms and garnering the resources to support that process. Thank you very much, uh, Evelyn. And, uh... Maybe we'll, it would be good if you can show also the um, the uh, the World Development Report uh, that figure that that shows the uh, these these nexus in a very in a very concise way. If you see in the figure, the external support can uh, keep the process moving up towards security, restoring confidence and transforming the institutions. Uh, however, if the stress becomes overwhelming, and external doesn't mean necessarily from outside the country, but outside of the institutions, that can lead to violence and security. But it is a constantly moving process. And although I've heard that some people speak of fragile states. I think that fragility is a condition that can emerge in almost any country. And so there's a constant need to provide internal incentives for reform and for transformation. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think that's very good. And I think this, this the uh, World War Report uh, 2011 is available. And as you can see clearly, very important thing the, uh, for this nexus is to have citizen security, justice, and job. Important aspect, as Milene said, is about institutions, is about the confidence. And these are the very good Indian the drivers for you to exit from the violence and, 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 and fragility. Good point is very important that all of us, all the countries, this is not about the conflict affected, but all the countries, we have a certain level of internal conflict or even uh, fragility. And to you to exit from this, this cycle, I think issues of institutions and confidence, and then especially is about cohesion, I think can lead you to citizen security, justice and job and creation of jobs. I think that's a very good way of, uh, of, uh, of summarizing. This one is, is available. You can get it also online if you want to be reading. Maybe we have, we have gone beyond our time. Uh, uh, Victor, we need, if just again, I just want you, if you can just in a very simple way, what is public expenditure for you? Uh, and, uh, and, and why is it so important? And I want to link it to in, in, in order to, 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 to bring this nexus between security, development, and justice. So, so just in a simple terms, what is it? Uh, this public expenditure review, and why is it so important? So understanding these new types of conflict have encouraged us to focus much more on governance as a source of stability. And so a public expenditure review uh, is 
a, a an approach it's a an instrument of analysis that was developed both by the world bank and and the by the world bank and the united nations to analyze the way that the national budget functions but it looks not just at the institutions but it looks at the budget process the big change has been that now the security sector is included in that entire process there were many years when the security sector was set aside uh, thought to respond to its own demands but now because we see that security depends on how well you take care of all the needs of the citizens, we must look at an allocative efficiency. And first of all, see, are we including everything in the government budget? The budgets are guided by principles. And uh, in the book, Securing Development, and we'll talk about 10 different budget principles. But these principles interact. And so now for the first time, we are applying the principle of comprehensiveness and including the security sector in this analysis. And when we look at it, we're looking at the every single institution and the different ministries and what the allocation is to each one of them. And we have now ministries, in a sense, competing, what they call contestability. They are competing to show that they can use the funds best to achieve the strategic objectives of the country. And so what we're going to do is look at two things how the institutions are structured, do they have proper, uh, proper laws, do they have proper mechanisms for oversight, and do they have proper capability for operational, um, uh, the expenditures and expenditure management. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, we would really, uh, as, as uh, Dr. William said, the, uh, this, this tool is, is available, and I think it's one of the things that we are referring to, and uh, I hope you'll have a chance to look at it. This is the first time the World Bank to manage to really look into the security sector and to, and to, and to audit it. And I think all the things to understand what is the status of the expenditure in the security sector. And I think that's a very important, we'll come to talk about later on, it is when we know what is happening and to what level are we creating this balance between this development, uh, 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 development security and, 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 and justice. So I think it's a very important tool that you may need to look at, and especially that when you are developing your national security strategy, it is one of the things that to understand the sector itself. And the World Bank is available for your countries, that it is, could be a good way to start uh, understanding what is, what, is, what is the status of its spending, military spending or security spending in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in Africa. So the, the last question, maybe just only briefly, uh, what are the lessons learned uh, from this public expenditure review uh, uh, of security sector in Africa, and uh, uh, particularly the alignment and allocation of security resources and effective use of such resources? Just some of the example in a brief way, what are the lessons learned from this exercise? Well, oh. there's, there are many uh, examples given in the book. I'll, I'll, I'll just, because of time, I'll, I'll very quickly go over two. One is the Central African Republic, where the public expenditure review identified um, and detailed off-budget revenues from several areas in the security sector. Uh, the sale of es escort or guard services, fines issued by the gendarmerie, and the airport security tax. These revenues totaled more than a million dollars. They came into the government. Uh, they came into the De Ministry of Defense, but somehow they didn't make it into the entire government budget. 
And so there was a question about how was it managed and what was it used for? That was a big question mark. The final example I'll offer is the one of Liberia. And you spoke about um, the transition. Liberia had developed a, a, a good national security strategy that appropriately identified the threats, most of them being internal. And they had also identified a need to develop a multi-year security budget to address the transition from UN personnel to national personnel. That was done very well. When you looked at Liberia, you also saw that there was a very good system of oversight in that there were committees in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, both parts of the legislature that were overseeing the security sector. So in principle, it looked good. When you got down to the process, when you looked at the controls and the oversight, there were deficiencies. Why? Because there was a lack of personnel, because in the uh, committee, committees didn't have the legislative personnel and the legislators themselves did not have the training in either the security sector or financial management that they needed to do their job well. Now, was that a Liberia problem? Was that uh, an African problem? No. When Trans Transparency International looked at the challenge of legislative oversight, it found that two thirds of the countries that they examined, and they looked at 82 countries, most of those countries had deficiency. Because first of all, there's a conceptual challenge in defining what security is and identifying the ways to address it. But also there's a considerable log logistical challenge in managing oversight in the security sector. You have to set up a way to deal with confidential information. You have to vet personnel who can handle that confidential information well. And you have to be able to determine what are the appropriate controls for your situation. And the fact that there were 16 countries in the world that did it right, that had the controls in place, gives us some hope that it can be done, but it means that resources must be devoted to training um, and developing the capacity within the government structure. Oh, oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Willian. I think you summarized it very well. So you could see clearly what, uh, I, I, I come back to the issue of Liberia. Uh, Liberia is one of the case studies that we have provided. Actually, we, can, we have case, many case studies of national security historic development. And Liberia tend to provide a good example of how having a national security strategy can really pay, can pay off. Uh, maybe things might have changed now, but I think it is good, a good example of, and that's why the public strategy review will tell you to what level are you balancing these, are you, are you putting more resources to, to, to security or to development or to justice at the expense or how can you balance it? So it's a, it's a good tool that I would really encourage you to, um, and a good example in this book as well.